present to you Professor Mohan Trinivasarao, who is going to talk, tell us about the topic in caging from the program. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Optics in the natural world, the well, decent colors of butterflies, and the twisted beetle. Okay, so I did try to change the title a little bit. Uh, Ivan had me talk about liquid crystals. Uh, I decided not to talk about liquid crystals. <laughs> Because everybody has been talking about liquid crystals. But there will be some of that. Uh, if you can't hear me, um, please yell at me saying speak louder or something. Uh, what I'm going to try and tell you today, this, this is kind of an unusual place for me to spend. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here in the first place. Uh, I've been running around like crazy trying to take photographs of the Wilson Cloud Chamber of uh, everything that, that I absolutely admire about science. You know, Lord Raleigh was here, his, you will see him a couple of times. You will see Wilson a couple of times in this talk. You will see Maxwell a little bit. Uh, and I don't know who else you will see, but we'll find out who you're going to see. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to tell you something about what we've been doing um, in, our, uh, in our lab. And this, of course, is um, David has a laser? laser pointer. Yeah, I have another one, too. <laughs> so my talks are usually made to stop at any given time. So this, if I'm going over, uh, uh, say something and I'll stop. Right? So what I'll try and tell you is something about optics in the natural world, uh, in particular beetles, birds, and butterflies. And I'll tell you what the connection is to the crystals at some point, probably towards the, uh, towards the beginning of the next talk. And that's largely why you see this title, Twisted Beetle. Uh, twisted in the sense that it has a chiral component to it, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, so much of the work, it, years ago I used to do work myself, these days I don't. Um, so Bong Jin Yoon, my student, Vivek Sharma, Matia Cherney, and Changok Park, most of them did the work. Um, and I should tell you, I should have talked to you when I was a graduate student, because then I didn't belong to any center, so I was far more intelligent back then than I am now. Um, okay. So you probably have seen some of these things. Um, so here are butterflies that are structurally colored. This particular color is because um, of physical structures on the wing scales. Um, this hummingbird has again colors not pigmentary in nature, but but because there are structural elements to, uh, to the wings or the feathers of the butterfly. And the peacock colors are again coming from the fact that there are structural elements that, that provide, the, provide the coloration. Um, and this is taken from National Geographic. This was, um, this was in fact, um, an issue on jewel beetles. Um, these were called jewel beetles because they are used in jewelry. So you can buy them as jewels uh, from Amazon for $20 or $30 if you're so interested. Uh, there are butterfly earrings, there are butterfly pendants, there are beetle pendants. But all of these have color not because of, of pigments, but largely because of, uh, uh, because of how chitin is deposited on the wing scales or the exocuticle of the beetle. Um, and if one were to look, at the beetle under a microscope. Um, there are very few people who have looked at this under a microscope, which I find rather surprising. Um, if you were to look at this particular beetle, uh, Chrysina gloriosa, um, yes, to the moment. There are more we need to lower the lights. Because your colors are so beautiful. There is one which is of everything, but it's probably going to be too dark. But no idea if it's going to be too dark. Let's start. <laughs> start pushing things? Yeah. I might turn the projector off, in which case you can all go home. <laughs> and those two guys are very happy if I did go home. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to do that. Maybe Ivan can do it. Um, so let me. Um, 
so if th these again are there because of uh, um, chitin, the way it's deposited on the, on the exocuticle of the beetles. And a lot of work was done in the very, very early days, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. So uh, my talk is sort of going to be split into two. One will be with butterflies and, um, and how to categorize them in terms of optical, um, optical structures. And then the other half of the talk will be, uh, it'll, it'll be on beetles and, and the connection to uh, liquid crystal phases. studied quite a bit by Lord Raleigh. If you've been walking around in the, in the hallways here, you find Lord Raleigh's uh, uh, pictures around and things that he did. Um, but he was quite interested in these, in these uh, butterflies and, among other things, uh, crystals as well. Uh, but more recently, they've been very popular because um, because of this language of tonic band gap as well. Thank you. Right, so you can have periodicity in one dimension, periodicity of classical disease in one dimension, or in two or in three dimensions. And so uh, they've sort of become very, very popular in the last two decades or so. Uh, using the language of photonic band gaps, people are trying to characterize all of these colors that you find um, using, um, using that language. And, and again, um, if you look in the biological world, there are very many interesting objects that produce um, interesting colors. So, in this case, this is taken out of Pete Bukusik's work. Um, it's a uh, 2D photonic crystal, as it were. Uh, it again has structural colors, and this particular one has a fluorescent dye, uh, which emits. Um, and because there is a two-dimensional photonic band gap, or a two-dimensional band gap, or a stock band, the fluorescent emission is sent in the forward direction. Um, you can think of this as a one-dimensional uh, crystal, if you will, uh, morpho. There are many varieties of morpho, but many of them are blue in, in color, but the essential idea is the color is produced by structural variation. So there are many variations on the theme. Uh, this, is, this is one such variation, uh, but there are many different varieties of producing a blue uh, by, by these structures interacting with, with light, um, and this, is, this just happens to be one of them. Uh, here, is a, here is a beetle that, has, that is colored because of, um, because of the diffraction grating on the exocubital. This one is an interesting one. It has a three-dimensional, uh, this particular one, uh, these are known as beetles, uh, again, a different class of beetles. Um, these, these guys essentially have a, a refractive index variation in three dimension. Again, all of these insects create these colors using chitin and air. That's the basic, basic structural element that these, these things have. Um, this one, I will spend a fair amount of time towards the very end, um, Chrysina gloriosa. I'm particularly very happy to talk about this because I like historical aspects of things. This is one of the first beetles that um, Michelson studied way back in 1911, um, because he was intrigued by the fact that this thing looks incredibly metallic in color. Um, and so he spent a fair amount of time thinking about it. Although liquid crystals were discovered back then, uh, I presume reading through uh, his papers, he wasn't aware of the fact that these might be analogous to liquid crystals, although he did suggest that there might be a ultra-microscopic screw or handedness to these objects, right? even though he didn't know of the existence of these liquid crystal materials. So now let me start off with the definitions a little bit. Uh, so if it moves, it's biology, if it stinks, it's chemistry, if it doesn't work, it's physics, and I should have them all to say that in, in, this, in this room, but nevertheless. Um, everyone wants to be interdisciplinary, right? So if it moves and stinks, it's biochemistry. If it fails to move, it's biophysics. So, so just so you know where we are. Okay, so a couple of things I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little bit 
a uh, little bit of a story about this particular beetle. Um, this is appears to you and me and to anyone else, including probably the butterfly, although no one has ever asked what this, uh, what this thing looks like to a butterfly. And I can tell you it probably is quite different to, to the butterfly and you will see why I say that. Um, but it, the perception is green. And then of course if you look at it with a microscope, what you find is, um, is a yellow reflection in the middle and then uh, coupled with the blue, so it actually additively color mixes blue and yellow to produce the color perception that it is green. There is no green pigment, there is no structural element that produces, produces green, uh, but it does uh, simply by varying the spacing and the shape of the structure that exists, it provides you the color perception that it's green. And this one, of course, reflects uh, circularly polarized light, so this is viewed with either unpolarized light or circular polar left circularly polarized left circular polarizer and then if you were to look at it with a right circular polarizer it sort of looks dull gray right so you don't see the color so this is this provides a um, highly uh, circularly polarized reflection um, of course I have to have the peacock because it's the national bird for India um, and so again all of these colors are simply by variation of structural elements on the um, on the feathers or the wing scales, if you will. So if you were to do electron microscopy on this, what you will find is each one of these things have a slightly different spacing of how the chitin or the keratin is spaced, and that's it. That's how it creates all these uh, brilliant colors. Um, it would be a shameless advertisement should I have taken this photograph, but I didn't. Um, so this is, if you go into Google, you can find this butterfly alphabet. These are all alphabets that, uh, that a photographer, all the patterns a photographer found on the wing scales of butterflies. You know, so you have most of these things. Okay. So what I'm going to tell you is a little bit about color science because most of everything I, I'm going to talk about deals with color and Maxwell, who was here, uh, labeled color science as a mental science. By that I don't mean it's a kooky science, but, but the fact that it says uh, your brain plays a big, big role. Right? So here are illusions, the tricks that the brain plays. You will see um, black dots. There are no black dots but your brain tells you there are black dots. Uh, how many of you think the colored object has the same reflectance as the other one, right? So if you look at this one and that one, how many of you think it's the, it has the same reflectance? Just a show of hands. This is not a trick question, right? And, and it turns out it is a trick question. Both of these have exactly the same reflectance. And it depends, it, it, it looks different to you because the context in which you're viewing the colors is very different. And so it is contextually dependent color. Um, it, so it's not, uh, everyone says seeing is believing. Well, uh, are you sure? Uh, you know, this one looks brighter to me than that one, but it turns out it is exactly the same. So these are all uh, illusions that, that, uh, uh, that people have created. Uh, I should have given credit to who did this. It's a professor at MIT. Both of these were done um, to, to show the illusions and the tricks the brain plays um, by the, the that man at uh, MIT. Right. So here's another one. Uh, this is even more stark. Yeah. Right? A and B have the same reflectance. Uh, if I just showed you this picture, you wouldn't believe it. But uh, you can go to Google and find this. Um, and and there is a deconstruction of this illusion. So when only these two squares are put on the screen, they are exactly the same reflectance. And then as they construct this checkerboard, you will begin to see, or your brain tells you that these two have different reflectances. So um, uh, the, the, there are many more tricks, that uh, illusions that are out there, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. But the only thing I want to tell you is if you're viewing colors of any kind, uh, and this is something Mark was talking about yesterday in terms of the color of the sky, the color of the sky should really be violet, even though Raleigh scattering says it's one over lambda to the fourth, um, but you can, in fact, see violet. 
that the sky isn't violet to us. Your brain actually tells you it's blue because that's the maximal scattered wavelength that you see. And, and there are reasons for it. We'll come back to, if I don't come back to, please ask me that later. So this is also sort of a quiz for you guys to see how many of you are not playing with your iPhones and how many of you are paying attention and how many of you are sleeping. I do that too, my apologies. Right. So, so sort of a timeline for color, uh, since I like to dwell a little bit on the history of things. Um, so people have been fascinated by color, obviously. Um, it dates back to at least Aristotle and then, of course, Newton identified light as the source of color. And he, will, he was also the first one to say, no light is color. When we say it's blue light, it's a meaningless statement. Colloquially, we use it's blue light. It's just, uh, they don't possess a color. Um, and then, of course, in, around 1810, Goethe had a theory of colors. Thomas Young pointed out uh, that we are probably trichromatic in nature. Um, and at dinner last night, we were talking, and there are a few people, and only women, uh, seem to have about 0.2% of the population of women have four photopigments in their eyes. They're not trichromatic, they have, they have four. So if you encounter one of those people, don't argue about color with them, you will not win. <laughs> because they can see a much larger color space than you ever can. And it is impossible to argue with them and win. And they are right, always. And I know one, and I have never, I've learned never to argue with that person. You know, whatever color she says it is, that is what it is. Huh? It's, huh? No, 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 no. This is uh, uh, a biochemist who lives in Johns Hopkins. His wife is uh, tetrachromatic. So I know this because we were trying to recruit that person to Georgia Tech and his wife came and we got into an argument about what the color was and very quickly John told me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Helmholtz in the 1850s, uh, he spent time thinking about the sensory physiology uh, and he also came to the conclusion that um, that most, most people are trichromatic. Um, and in fact, James Clark Maxwell, in, around 1852, it turns out he was an undergraduate then, um, he said color science is a mental science, meaning um, your brain plays a significant role in, in deciding what the color is. Um, and he was awarded the Romford Medal in 1860 for his research on the composition of colors and other optical papers. Okay, so uh, Lord Rayleigh also spent a whole lot of time on a lot of things, including color science. Uh, contributed to Rayleigh's cathodic uh, blue of the sky being one over lambda to the fourth. Um, some of you may not know this. Um, he was the discoverer of argon, for which he won the physics prize in 1904. Uh, spent a lot of time thinking of breadth figures. Um, I will say a little bit about that, but all of you probably know what they are. If you don't, you see it every day and you probably don't spend enough time looking around. Um, if you have a hot cup of coffee, you have these condensation figures or breath figures. Or if you breathe on a, on a glass, you have breath figures. If you drink a cold glass of beer, you have breath figures condensing on them. So these are all nothing but water droplets that condense on a cold surface. And this is also what led Charles Thomas Reese Wilson to invent the Wilson Cloud Chamber that won him the Nobel Prize. So, um, of course, Raleigh instability, various contributions to color science, and the Raleigh criterion for resolution, among other things. Resolution, not from the point of view of uh, resonates, but for the resolution of uh, uh, light microscopes. And so here is uh, Charles Thomas Reese Wilson uh, for the Wilson Cloud Chamber again. He understood you can use these ions as nucleating sites over which water molecules condense to give you the tracks of these, of these particles in which you can observe. And, and so I will spend a little bit of time on, uh, on both Raleigh's work and Wilson's work. Okay, 
Um, so definition of color, so this is sort of a crash course in color science in about two minutes. Um, people who are interested in, in color science think about these three things. Uh, hue, saturation, and brightness. Uh, hue is something that uh, we think of as the colors as we define them, blue, green, yellow, and red. I probably should tell you why I got into color science in the first place. Um, when I was an assistant professor, um, you know, one of the first things they told me to teach was I was going to teach polymer physics. So I said, okay, great, you know, I know enough about polymers to, uh, to make my way through a whole semester, no problem. Five days before classes started, my chair said, well, you're going to teach color science. So I said, what the hell is color science? <laughs> All I know is if lambda is 514, it looks green, because I had an Arduino laser, right? So uh, it turns out looks is the key in that statement. Um, and I told them, you know, if that's all I know, and I can't run an entire semester knowing that, right? So, but then I, I ended up learning a lot about it, and then I got very interested in, in this particular aspect of, of science, and, and so here I am talking to you guys. Right? Um, you can also, if you look up the Oxford Dictionary, you will see the definition of color, and this sensation, of course, can be created by other means, such as pressure in the back of the eye or an electric current. I have done this to myself. I am not qualified to do it for you. Right? So don't do that. That's quite painful. But it is true. If you have pressure in the back of your eyes, um, you can actually see the colors even though you have no um, uh, visual perception. The, the eye is not acting as a detector, but you can see the colors. Now, see the colors. Uh, your brain is telling you you're seeing these colors. Um, and so, this, the 1931 CIE standard observer was, uh, was created to figure out how people actually view colors. And Maxwell, of course, had, had shown that if you have red, green, and blue, arbitrary primary colors, um, you could in fact create as many colors as you like. You can produce almost all the colors. Well, not quite, as it turns out. Uh, so what you're, what, before we knew we were trichromatic, and before we had uh, experiments to figure out what photopigments we have in, in our visual system, um, the way people figured out how sensitive we were uh, to color was with, by doing the following experiment. You're given a test stimulus, and then you're given red, green, and blue, so you can change the intensities, the amount of the light that you add to this. And the task was you needed to color match uh, the test stimulus with, by additive mixing of red, green, and blue. Occasionally, what you found was you couldn't, you couldn't match the colors. You had, you had to add some of this to, this to the test stimulus. So then, so this is sort of what a normal, I always say this wrong going to say a normal human being. There are no normal human beings. There are human beings with normal color vision. So if you have normal color vision, uh, and then your response to these colors looks something like this. So a necessary item for color then, you need a light source, an object that it illuminates, the eye and the brain, to perceive the color. Right. So uh, these are sort of important things to, to, to have. And so you can calculate um, so this is one of the formulas for Professor Longa here, right? So one. I have two more, I think, in the whole talk. Maybe three. Um, so the procedure for calculating the tristimulus values of prescribing color is the following. So you take the spectrum of the light source. Uh, you take what the object does, either the reflectance of the transmission or the wavelength of, uh, or scattering or whatever have you. And then the standard observer function. And so these, these functions are tabulated in all color science textbooks according to um, two nanometer uh, part wavelengths and stuff. And so you multiply all of these things or you, in, in the integral form, you can have these tristimulus values are just the integral of the power spectrum times the, um, times the reflectance times the standard observer function. So each one of these x bar, y bar, and z bar, they are all 
um, the response of your human, of your visual system to, uh, to various variables. And so you end up calculating these two little values, x and y. And you plot them on the plot uh, known as the chromaticity diagram, um, an, an xy plot. So if he had done the experiment that Newton did, uh, split white light with a prism, and looked at all the wavelengths, so those are all pure colors, if you will. Uh, so all the pure colors would lie on the, um, on the tongue-shaped curve at the very edge. Right? So, so these are the pure spectrum colors. So if you had a laser light source uh, that went, that you could tune from 430 to, to 650, and each one had its own uh, individual wavelength, then all of those would lie there. And if you mix the blues with the red, you get the non-pure or the non-spectral colors. This is known as the purplest locus, meaning these are not pure spectral colors, these are just mixtures. And then this white triangle, which is sort of dated um, to maybe 20 years ago, uh, this is what you find on the TV screens. And the this is the range of colors that you and I can perceive if we have normal color vision. So there's, there's a lot of effort uh, to, to figure out how to make this color space uh, bigger than what it is so that you can have much better colors for your entertainment purposes. Right? And um, Mark talked about this a little bit yesterday, but he had a different, uh, different way of presenting that which was very nice, but here's a Here's another way of presenting that. Um, color is, of course, three-dimensional in nature. Um, and the white point, of course, if I keep increasing the intensity of the light source that I have, of any colors that I have, then the color space keeps decreasing. And at extremely high intensities, you see nothing but white. So it all, it all comes to a white point. So if you want to think of it, that's it. You can think of it as a singularity, but essentially all that means is all the photopigments are completely saturated and you have no, no color vision of any kind. So if you have incredibly high intensities, your color space keeps decreasing. So this is, this is for, for, people, um, uh, for people who have trichromatic vision. So if you have uh, four, then that's a different issue. Okay. So just to be clear, uh, so here is color mixing, uh, both additive and subtractive. If you have additive mixing, you add red, green, and blue. Of course, when all of these are mixed, uh, you get white. Um, and if you mix all of these things in the middle, uh, you get dark. In this case, light is absorbed. In this case, light is being mixed. So this is so some of the butterflies, in fact, use additive mixing to create the color perception. So in this case, uh, if you mix yellow and green, uh, you uh, sorry red. Red and green, you produce yellow in this case. Um, there are colors due to interference, um, and this is what you can consider them to be structural colors if you if you're so inclined. Although there is no structure, uh, so to speak, but this is the double refraction that uh, that Mark referred to yesterday. Um, so here is the interference colors of a thin ice cube. Each of these colors then represent the different orientations in which the crystal is arranged. Um, and so you get the biofringence is slightly different. Um, and of course you can uh, use the Michelery chart to figure out if you color match this color to, to the appropriate quantity. And if you know what the thickness is, you can calculate what the, uh, what the optical anisotropy now, there is a problem, which is uh, if you don't have very good color vision, uh, then you may match this green uh, to be sort of that green, in which case you will be off in determining what the biofringence is. However, um, you can use, so here is the Michel Levy chart, a little bit more expanded. So if you make a mistake in thinking that this green is this particular green, then you will make an error in determining what the biofringence is. And this has happened, and companies have sued each other for tens of millions of dollars because somebody didn't have good color vision, and, and they screwed up. They thought this green was that green, or this green was that green, in which case you determine the biofringence to be completely different. Now, there is a very unique way of doing this, and this is something that uh, 
that I'm very proud to say that I was scooped by Lord Raleigh 120 years ago. So I did this calculation in 1999, and Raleigh had done this calculation in 1879 and published it, and it was in the uh, collected works of Lord Raleigh. Um, and the point here is if you, um, if you use different illumination sources, if you use a halogen lamp or a tungsten lamp, then that, that coordinate system looks different. But these numbers are the retardation. So this is the thickness times the birefringence of the, of the object that you have. And each point here is for a different retardation, and each of these are very uniquely defined. So you can't make a mistake if you do it this way. But if you do it this way, you can make a mistake. You can mistake this green to be that green. That's very easy to do. But if you use the transmission and calculate what the transmission characteristics are for a given birefringence, then each one of those is absolutely unique. And, and you will not make a mistake. But no one ever uses these, um, even though Raleigh published this in 1879. Okay, so early microscopist, way of finding things out. So I hope I don't do this just by looking at a small part and, and, and claim that it's the, it's the mammoth. So here are some examples of structural color. Um, um, so if I were to look at the wings of this uh, butterfly uh, at higher and higher magnification, so there are tens of thousands of these individual wing scales. Each wing scale is about 150 microns long. Uh, and about 50 microns wide. And if I magnify that, you see all these lamellae kind of structures. And if you magnify that even further, um, so this is what is referred to as a Christmas tree arrangement, if you will. Um, and it is the interaction of light with these structures that produces the blue that you find in the blue morpho. That's for this particular one. Now, um, there are many variations on the same theme. Uh, it doesn't have to be this kind of a roughness. There are other uh, variations, and I'll show you one of those. And so here is a different blue morpho, which has structures that look like this. Uh, the papillium sort of has a two-dimensional one. These are all focused on the milling of the wing scales to, to show you what the structure looks like. And this one is uh, C. rubi. This has a three-dimensional structure. It is, in fact, a double gyroid. So if you looked at the surfactant literature, uh, there are some surfactants at certain concentrations that will form a double uh, bicontinuous structure. And that's what is on the wing scale of this, so that it doesn't, it, it doesn't look iridescent, but the color is, of course, uh, structural in nature. Uh, Somebody asked me about hummingbirds this, this morning. Uh, so here is the hummingbird, and if you took the, uh, took the feathers and looked at it under a microscope, what you will find is you have all these little, uh, little bubbles. These are all air pockets enca encapsulated in a polymer film. And the colors, the various colors are just produced simply by changing the spacing of these, <coughs> these air pockets in, in, the, in the feathers. It's actually quite remarkable produces all these brilliant colors, and the only thing it needs to do is change the spacing. There the are very few dyes in them, so it doesn't, it's not expensive to, to, to make these sorts of things. So here is another example of a blue morpho. So this is sort of the low magnification, and this is a high magnification image. And again, these are precisely 90 nanometer holes that interact with light to provide you, uh, provide you the blue color. Now, if I were to incorporate acetone or some other liquid that penetrates into this, all I'm doing is changing the refractive index contrast between the, between the object and this, this wing will change its color. And so there are people who are using this as gas sensors these days. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any of these applications. And they are very uh, angle dependent colors, so if you look if this is at normal incidence, this is at about 45 or 50 degrees, and at grazing incidence, it becomes completely dark. And it, it actually depends on whether you look in this direction or in that direction. So if you want to quantify the reflectance of these things, you have to measure the reflectance 
over all very over all the angles that, that you possibly can think of. So here is here is another example of the same thing. So in this orientation you can see the colors, but if you if you turn the butterfly 90 degrees, uh, you don't see the colors. It's, it's quite directional. And here is an example um, of the blue morpho wing being um, um, adding acetone to the wing, saturated with acetone, vapor changes it into uh, into green wing. So these are incredibly good demonstrations to do in high schools to get people interested because as the acetone evaporates from the wing, the blue comes back. So you can in fact monitor how fast the evaporation is occurring if you're so inclined. Okay, uh, let me skip over these things. Um, so the point is, uh, if you want to characterize the reflectance uh, from these materials, from these uh, insects, you have to um, you have to make measurements where you vary the incident angle, and you also vary the direction in which the wing scale is is um, uh, is oriented, and you need to measure the reflectance uh, over all these angles that are specified. Now this is. This is not easy to do. People didn't do these things for a long time. Um, and these are some, uh, some instruments that people have built. Duke Listavanga has built this uh, incredibly complicated um, uh, device for making measurements of the reflectance of these objects. And this, of course, is, an, is a beautiful machine because it, it's, it's so sensitive that you will measure the reflectivity over all the angles that you can possibly have, except it's very quite difficult to construct this and you have to be in the basement somewhere so that there are no vibrations and things of that sort. So you have to mount an individual wing scale uh, someplace here, and if that mounting, again, the wing scales are about 150 microns long and 50 microns wide, and if you don't do it right, uh, then you won't get the right reflectance. So there, there are and so what we have been doing is we use the microscope to, um, uh, if you, any normal, any good light microscope has a Burton lens which allows you to look in the Fourier plane of the, of the microscope. So you can change the angle in which the light beam comes in, and that's very easy to do in a light microscope. And then you can, in the Q space, you can essentially measure what the reflectance is. And so you can do this as a function function of the angle in which the individual wing scales are, you can control the incident angles and you can in, in principle calculate the entire reflectance function that you're that you're after. So you can calibrate this very easily. So each of these circles here represent um, uh, represent the angle at which it, it, it really represents the angular uh, collection angle of your microscope. If you know what the numerical aperture of your microscope is uh, then it's very easy to make measurements of these, uh, these reflectors. So the idea is, uh, in order to calibrate this, you use an aluminum mirror. So if, if, if it's normal incidence or uh, the incident angle is zero, uh, then you have a reflective spot right in, right in the middle of the, uh, middle of the beam, uh, middle of the optical axis of the microscope. And if, if it is 30 degrees, so you can bring it in. And of course, you see this little spot. So you can, you can have you can have the object that you want uh, and make measurements of the reflectance very, very easily. And you can have a rotational stage so that you can rotate the long axis of the object that you have and you can make measurements of all of these. So that's sort of what's, what's shown here for the different, uh, the different orientations of the wing scale. You see uh, that uh, there is a minimum, the, the reflected, uh, you can see the streak of the light that's being reflected. Now, this is of course, this was done for an incident angle of zero degrees. And so you send in light beam at zero degrees and it's reflected at about 10 degrees. So irrespective of way, which way the thing is oriented, this angle, the reflected angle is 10 degrees for an incident angle of, of zero, right? But that's not the case if I change the incident angle to be 30 degrees. So you need to know what this, angular dependencies. So as you, as you go through this, you will notice that um, the reflectance changes quite a lot. 
And so you can use this information to calculate uh, what's known as the bidirectional reflection of these things and then, and then plot it in terms of uh, all the angles that you care. Um, okay, so now to the, and I'm running short on time, and I'll run through this fairly quickly. Um, so as I already said, this, this, this butterfly looks green. Um, but if you look at it under a microscope, it in fact, um, it color mixes yellow and blue to provide you the color perception that it is green. So this is something uh, Pete Vukusik observed and, and so did we. Uh, and Pete published a beautiful paper some 13 years ago. Uh, and here is a much better image of this. So this is the yellow reflection uh, and, and the blue reflection in the edges. And the essential idea is, in this particular case, the butterfly has a multi-layered structure and it's shaped as a cup. Right? So that's sort of schematically shown here. And the conditions for interference are such that if I have light incident normally at the cup, the reflectance is yellow. And if I look at the light that's incident at, at an angle to this cup, at, at the edges of the cup at 45 degrees or so, you get the interference is, of course, blue shifted. Um, and so you get blue light that's being reflected, and that gets reflected again, or retro-reflected back to you. So you have yellow and blue that is being retro-reflected back to, to provide you the color perception that it is green. Now, if this, is, this particular image has a polarizer in it, that's why you see the extinction along that line, so the <laughs> polarizer is oriented in that direction. So if I had if I view this under cross polarizers, I can extinguish the yellow reflection, but I can't extinguish the blue, because at every interface there is a reflection, there is a change, there is a rotation in the plane of polarization. So this this polarization is rotated by 90 degrees and again by 90 degrees. So I cannot extinguish that light. So if I were to look at it under cross polarizers, you see the you see the blue, but you also see the cross in which. Uh, in the, the, describing the direction in which the polarizers are. And so these are all, um, so this is what um, uh, Pete published in, in 2000. So this is, the, this is the cup and this is the structure of the, of the wing scale, um, individual cups. So this has 11 layers of chitin and air. Light that's reflected normal is yellow, as shown here, and light that's reflected from the edges uh, is blue, is blue shifted and the, and the color variation is such that it provides you the color perception that it's green. Okay, so you can do spectroscopy and figure out what the, what the color mixing is. Um, and we try to mimic this and I have, I guess, two minutes, I'll quit in just a second. Um, we try to mimic this and we use the process that we have been spending a lot of time thinking about. So you take a polymer solution, very dilute polymer solution. This is something all of you can do. It's a very easy experiment. Even I can do this. Right? So just to, you may not believe me, but this is an image that I, a film that I made and I did the microscopy for this. Right? Um, so here is a very dilute polymer solution. You blow moist air across. And what you end up in about one minute or so is this ordered array of holes in the polymer film. This has its roots in what Lord Raleigh did and what CTR Wilson did. And that's largely the reason why I decided to include it here, um, just because I am in the Cavendish labs. Um, and so the essential mechanism then is you, you uh, evaporate the solvent, so you essentially cool the solution. And if you have a very cold surface, then uh, moisture condenses. Moisture in your breath, in fact, condenses. Don't do this after you drink lots of alcohol. <laughs> this will not work um, because your breath has no moisture at that point. Um, or very little anyway. Um, and then moisture condenses and these water droplets behave as hard spheres. Um, Completely analogous to another case that someone here did. Uh, uh, Bragg had made these uh, bubble raft arrays to, to show um, dislocations in crystals. 
And these water droplets, in fact, behave as hard spheres, and they have all the defects you would find um, in the bubble wraps. Eventually, um, when the film comes back to room temperature, of course, all the water droplets evaporate, go away, leave you with this very nice ordered array of holes. And here is a confocal image of that. These are uh, essentially uh, nicely ordered, interconnected set of holes. And so this has its roots again, as I said. Um, uh, Wilson understood that if you have uh, air that is super saturated, you could in fact create conditions where uh, moisture will condense, and that was used uh, to image how the particles uh, interacted with each other. And that's essentially what we do as well. And so here is, here is an example of that uh, condensation. If you have relative humidity, you get a fog, and of course this is because of the nucleation growth of water drop. I'll not spend any time on this. Okay, so when you do that, um, you essentially have these films. Um, so this, you can have a scotch tape and peel that film off. Uh, so this is the unpeeled part. Here is the peeled part. This is from the wing scale of the butterfly. And now we have these cups. All we need is, um, is a multi-layer. So we do atomic layer deposition of alumina and titania. And this is what the butterfly does, this is what we can do. Well, we're not as good as the butterfly, but still not too bad. At least that's my opinion. Okay, so let me stop here and uh, see if there are any questions. Any questions? Pressure for these butterflies is they have to eat certain leaves only for the larvae. And so it has to have a precise color matching of where it wants to lay the eggs. These, some of these butterflies will not lay eggs anywhere else. You know, they will go exactly to that particular plant and lay the egg. Um, and apparently, being bright uh, has, has two things. One, of course, is don't eat me, I'm, I can be poisonous. But the second thing is, um, if you think about the optics of this, if the wings are flapping, the colors are very uh, angle dependent. It's very difficult if I'm a predator to figure out where you are because your colors change. It gives it enough time for it to escape. I have a very closely related question. Um, I will give you a closely related answer. <laughs> So, mammals are not very colorful, by and large. Um, but you can look at birds, and there are some gorgeous birds out there, and there's some very ordinary birds, like sparrows. <coughs> Insects, again, the same thing. So presumably, those that don't have the color have some other mechanism of survival. So this may be sort of outside of your field. Um, so what does... And not having color mean in terms of survival, and how do they continue to survive and thrive? I, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but what I can tell you uh, 
even though we are not <coughs> colorful as these butterflies are, um, and I'm going to get in trouble for making the statement I'm about to make, <laughs> but that has never stopped me anyway. Uh, we all make decisions based on appearance, whether you like it or not. Everything we do, um, if you really think about it, we make the decisions based on um, how it appears to us and how appealing it is to us. That is completely subjective. You know, I like this, this puppy. There are people who don't like this. But this, this girl looks absolutely beautiful to me, but th this girl is not beautiful to someone that I know. I don't let them in my house. <laughs> so it's your fault. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker again, please. So, Professor Srinivasa Rao is going to give